I want to welcome you all to my corporate forum lecture today for Snowasis Medical at the AAP 2020 virtual annual meeting. I hope you're all doing well, staying safe, keeping healthy, some very interesting times that we're living in. And while I was excited to originally give this lecture to you behind a podium live in Honolulu, unfortunately, we can't do that. And I'm just as excited to be able to use virtual platform like this to connect and engage in some meaningful discussion and dialogue. My name is Dr. Vinay Bide, and I'm a periodontist in Canada. And I'm going to be speaking today about my clinical experience with amnion chorion membranes, which are commercially available as BioExclude from Snowasis Medical, in the context of using them as a sole barrier membrane for lateral ridge augmentation applications. Whether you're new to this product or have experience with it, I'm confident that in the next 45 minutes or so, you will pick up a few pearls or learn some new things that you'll be able to implement in your practices tomorrow. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak at the AAP meeting in front of my peers and colleagues. It's been, it's been a goal of mine for the past few years, so I'm very, very excited having realized that goal and being able to lecture to you today. I would like to start off by thanking Snowasis Medical for inviting me to speak at the corporate forum and for providing me with this platform to share my experience with BioExclude with you here today. And I'd like to particularly mention Robert Tofi and Ashley Ali of Snowasis, whose encouragement over the past two and a half to three years in documenting my cases has essentially culminated in me being here today. So I'm really, really grateful for that. A little bit about myself. I spend most of my days working in a group periodontics practice in the small town of Aurora, which is about 20 miles north of Toronto. It's situated perfectly. It's just far enough away from the big city, hustle and bustle, but just close enough to be able to enjoy it without having to go too far. I'm blessed to have an awesome family at work that keeps things on track and running smoothly and efficiently and allows myself and my three colleagues who I work with, who are incredibly talented clinicians and periodontists, to be able to do what we do at the highest level. I teach part-time at the University of Toronto in the Division of Periodontics, where I'm involved in the teaching of graduate residents as they navigate uh, through their training program. It's humbling to be able to teach and influence young clinicians as they're starting out, but at the same time, I actually learn probably more from them than they probably realize. I'm constantly preaching the three tenets of success, predictability, and reproducibility to my periodontics residents, particularly when, it, when they want to try something a little bit avant-garde. Success is that a particular procedure works, gets you the desired outcome. Predictability is being able to achieve that success repeatedly. And reproducibility is when many different individuals and clinicians are able to achieve similar success and predictability. One such therapeutic modality, which we're going to be spending the entire lecture talking about today, is guided bone regeneration, or GBR. We know from the literature over the past 25 to 30 years that this is a validated and predictable procedure that allows us to reconstruct deficient alveolar ridges where bone has been lost as a result of long-standing tooth loss and or the disease process. It typically involves the use of particulate bone, be it autogenous, allogeneic, xenogeneic, used alone or in combination, which is then covered with a barrier membrane. Most typically, we use conventional collagen membranes, either non-cross-linked or cross-linked, um, and there are synthetic membranes uh, on the market as well that are very popular, which are resorbing or non-resorbing. And the purpose of these membranes traditionally has been to prevent epithelial ingrowth into the healing wound. Over the past 25-30 years, there have been a variety of biomaterials that have been developed, which have been validated and shown to be successful in the literature for achieving good bone regeneration. Most of us are familiar with the past principle for predictable GBR outcomes as outlined by 
Professor Homily Wang from Michigan and his colleague in 2006. And the past principle postulates are that we need to have primary closure, we need to have good blood supply and angiogenesis, we want to have space maintenance, which is typically provided for by our membranes that we use, and we want to have stability of this regenerating bone underneath the membrane. Furthermore, we also need the interaction between various signaling molecules, a scaffold, and appropriate cells over a requisite period of time, typically for bone, we're looking at about six to nine months, in order to achieve optimal regeneration. Because of advances over the last 25, 30 years, we can now take a ridge that looks like this, which is obviously deficient, and turn it into a ridge like this, which is now suitable for implant placement, because that really is the end goal of GBR. We're not just doing it to grow bone and take a pretty picture that we can post on social media. We're doing GBR so that we can place implants in a prosthetically determined location, which can then be restored, which a patient can function with. Now, one thing that I've seen a number of clinicians do, or at least heard a number of clinicians do when, when talking to my various colleagues, is they use multiple membranes sometimes in one procedure. So this case was provided to me by a former resident, now colleague of mine, uh, who was extracting an upper right canine tooth. After she extracted this tooth, she noted that there was substantial deficiency of bone on the buckle. So after debriding the socket in an attempt to be minimally invasive. She took a conventional collagen membrane and placed it where the deficient bone was in order to attempt to recreate uh, the buccal wall of bone. She then grafted the socket with a particulate material and then closed over with a non-resorbing synthetic membrane. Now I completely understand why she did this and I understand the rationale behind why she did this, but when you think about the cost that's associated with this, right? You've got the particulate bone, you've got the membrane on the buckle, you've got the membrane on top, which is gonna be left exposed. This does add significant cost to the procedure. You're paying for the materials and then you're transferring that cost to your patients who are in turn paying a higher fee for these services. Now, what if there was a material where one material alone could do everything that my colleague tried to do in this case with two membranes. And this is where I found that BioExclude really, really serves that role very well. So what is BioExclude? A number of us uh, have seen this uh, on social media, used it in our clinics. It's a, it's a very thin, radiolucent membrane that comes with a, a smiley face emblazoned on it. BioExclude is a deepithelialized human amnion chorion membrane. Now I'm not going to get too much into the nitty-gritty of the science and biology of this device because Dr. Mariner is going to more than sufficiently cover that in his lectures. But as a clinician, what is it that I would really want to know about this biomaterial and, that, and then convey that to you. So we'll recall from our anatomy classes that uh, the placental sac is lined by a double layer of amnion chorion. Amnion chorion, um, the amnion is the layer of the placental membrane which is closest to the fetus, and the chorion layer is the layer that's closest to the uterus. If we were to zoom on this further, we would see that the amnion and chorion are also made up of various layers. And these layers contain different types of collagens, which are primarily type 1 and 3, as well as other extracellular molecules like fibronectin, laminin, as well as other various proteoglycans. Both the amnion and chorion layers have basement membranes, so this really is uh, a true barrier. Okay, and when you think about what it what it what it does, it's protecting um, it's pr protecting the developing uter uh, developing fetus, so it has to be resilient as well. 
So the spongy layer between the amnion and chorion is removed. So the, the, there's a patented process to, to make what we call bioexclude. It's called the purion process. The spongy layer between the amnion and chorion is removed. The epithelial layer is then removed, exposing the basement membrane. And this is why there is no orientation and why bioexclude can be folded onto itself. Additionally, the laminin in the exposed basement membrane hastens cellular migration. And the amnion and chorion layers are then laminated together, and this is what leads to us getting bioexclude. Bioexclude has some very unique physical and biological properties, and when you think about it, it makes sense considering what placental tissue has to do for developing fetus, um, it has to have various unique properties. Bioexclude is both a barrier as well as a carrier. It is a barrier in that it can prevent epithelium from getting into the regenerating site, but it is also a carrier of many different bioactive molecules. In fact, the bioexclude membrane contains well over 250 various biological goodies, as I call them, ranging from extracellular matrix proteins, cytokines, uh, favorable interleukins, tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases. And because of this, it has anti-inflammatory effects. And studies have also shown that it can also have antimicrobial effects. So it really is a unique device. Um, it, it, you can't really compare this to the conventional collagen membranes that most of us use because those are essentially more or less inert membranes whereas this is an actual bioactive device. It also comes in different sizes for different indications so it comes in an 8x8, 12x12, 10x20, 15x20, 15x25 and 20x30 size. The workhorses for me in my private practice are the 12 by 12, which I use for socket preservations, uh, the 15 by 20, which I'll use mostly for GTR cases around natural teeth and maybe some smaller GBR sites, and then the 20 by 30, which I'll use for larger GBR sites. So it really is a, a Swiss army knife in terms of its, its versatility, if I can use that metaphor. Bioexclude can be used for all these different clinical indications, and certainly I've used Bioexclude for the vast majority of these indications. The only ones that I haven't really used it for are for nerve repair, because that's a little bit above and beyond my normal scope of practice. And I haven't really had to use it for a Schneiderian membrane repair. But having said that, I, I will include this in most of my lateral window sinus lifts just as a protective layer against the Schneiderian membrane in case there have been some microperforations. And I also use it to cover the window of my sinus lifts as well. But I use it primarily for socket preservation, uh, GTR. I've also started using it for, for peri-implantitis um, treatment as well, um, and started using it to some degree for non-surgical peritoneal therapy. Um, it actually works really well in, uh, in deep pockets as an adjunct to scaling and root planing. But I use it a lot. I use it a lot for ridge augmentations and GBRs, which we're going to be talking about ad nauseum today. So let's get right into these cases. Um, and I'm going to take you through four typical scenarios of GBR that one would encounter in their daily practice. So let's now take a look at the first case that I want to share with you, which is of horizontal GBR in the anterior maxilla. And I'm starting off with this case because this particular region is the one region that I probably have the most experience with using bioexclude as a sole barrier membrane for horizontal GBR. This gentleman was referred to me by his general dentist in 2018. At the time, he was 48 years old. He was a healthy guy, did not smoke, had a stable periodontal condition. He was referred because the dentist wanted me to place two implants, one in the edentulous number 8 site and one in the number 10 site, 
with the view of restoring this with a screw-retained 3-unit fixed bridge. To give you some history on this gentleman, he'd lost these teeth many years ago due to traumatic accident playing hockey, which is not uncommon here in Canada. And in fact, some would consider this a somewhat of a badge of honor. But nonetheless, he was in his late teens at the time, and for the better part of 30 years, he was wearing an RPD. He was now finally in a position where he could pursue implant therapy. So one thing I've come to appreciate about cases like this is when you look at the soft tissues, they look pretty thick. They look, in fact, deceptively thick because oftentimes the underlying bone does not quite um, match up to what you see with the overlying soft tissue. And uh, it took me a few times early in my career where I was burned by this, where I'd raise a flap only to be disappointed with the amount of bone that there was, having now to do a GBR procedure that I hadn't prepared the patient for adequately. So now almost always I will take routinely a cone beam CT scan of this area. So when we look at the CBCT scans, now these are obviously two representative slices of the overall scan to give you an idea of what the bone width and height would be at the number eight and number 10 sites. Certainly at the number eight site, the thickness looks fairly reasonable, um, but there's still that rich concavity is very mild, it would be a Seabird class one, as it would be with the number 10 site, which has perhaps a little bit more of a pronounced concavity, a deficiency of the uh, buccal bone. If we were to plan our implant placement with the way things are, we would see that in the number 10 site, a substantial part of that implant would actually be denuded of bone and outside the uh, envelope. Not so much in the number eight site where the bone would still be thin and intact, but we likely would have to do bone grafting at the time of implant placement. Now, one thing that I've become over the last eight to 10 years when it comes to surgical implantology is to be more conservative. I, I really do subscribe to the adage of one miracle at a time, especially in a patient like this where he's been missing his teeth for a good number of years and that too in the anterior aesthetic zone. So I feel, I feel that it's just better for me to, to build up the bone to the proper dimension so that when I place the implant six or seven months later, I can follow the exact prosthetic prescription as laid out to me by the restoring dentist. So our treatment plan starts off with doing a horizontal GBR procedure for this gentleman. This is my usual flap design, incision design for these GBR cases where I will typically make a paracrestal incision along the edentulous ridge uh, and raise a full thickness buccal and palatal flap. On the buccal, I will then extend that one tooth over where I will then make my oblique vertical releasing incisions. This allows me to raise a nice big flap with a wide base where I've got plenty of accessibility. If I've got good accessibility, I can place my bone graft the way that I want. I can place the membrane the way that I want. Um, because if I can do that, then I increase my chances of getting the optimal bone regeneration that I so desire. Over the last few years, I've been using a safe scraper to decorticate the area and harvest autogenous bone shavings from the site, which I can then mix in with my bone graft particulate, which in this case happens to be an osteoconductive uh, xenogeneic particulate. Now, getting back to this whole thing about decortication, I know the literature is very mixed when it comes to whether it's necessary or not. I decorticate in these cases simply as a means of actually getting autogenous cells, which I can then mix in with my osteoconductive or osteoinductive bone graft material. We can then take this composite graft mixture and graft the deficient area. I've only shown the number 10 site grafted here. Both sites were grafted, of course, but this photo was representative of the other side as well. After placing our bone graft the way that we want, we can then place our bioexclude membrane. And for those of you who have used this membrane, you can attest to the importance of placing this membrane in a dry state. There's definitely a learning curve when you're starting out when it comes to the various nuances of handling, but if this membrane becomes hydrated prior to placement, it becomes difficult to manage and it's not easy to unfold it from itself. Not saying it, can be, it can't be done, but it's something you'd rather not have to do. So again, very, very important to place this membrane in a dry state. Once you place the membrane and it starts to contact the oral fluid, 
it will drape and adhere very intimately to the site, as you can see from this picture. Sometimes I'll have my assistant have some saline on hand and I'll then wet the tip of a cotton plier or a periostal elevator to just tamp the membrane down or spot welding it, if you will, uh, to keep it nicely in place. The other thing is that you don't need to trim the material as you can carefully fold the extraneous edges over onto themselves and continue to take advantage of all the bioactivity that's inherent in this membrane. And as you can also see from the picture, last but not least, there's no additional methods of fixation such as tacks or sutures that are required. And truth be told, the material is uh, too delicate to be able to handle tacks anyway, but it's not even required, so uh, it's a moot point. After doing a few of these GBR procedures with the bioxlude membrane, I started noticing that it kind of reminded me of, of a rice paper roll, both in terms of its appearance and in terms of its consistency. And so just like other bone grafting procedures that we all know, such as the ice cream cone technique or the sausage technique, I decided to coin the rice paper roll GBR technique. And I use this technique for horizontal GBR procedures where I'm not worried about the vertical height of bone. We can use a particulate graft, preferably with autogenous scrapings in a 50-50 mix. And whether you use an allograft or xenograft, I leave that up to personal preference. I've used both with uh, equal success. We can then take our bioexclude amnion chorion membrane and place this carefully over top of the bone graft. Tension-free primary closure is an absolute requirement if we want to see the best chances of success. And speaking of conservatism, I typically will not go back into a site for a minimum of six months. Bone takes time to heal. And the few times that I've tried to go in earlier, oftentimes, more often than not, I've been disappointed with the quality of the bone. And this point has perhaps been more appreciated by me during the COVID lockdown because I had a few patients that were supposed to have their re-entry surgeries for implant placement during the COVID lockdown, but then because of the lockdown got delayed by a couple of months. And the quality of bone just from waiting those two extra months was pleasantly surprising to me in terms of how good it really was. So minimum six months healing. On average, I typically wait about seven or eight. Once we're satisfied that we've placed our bone graft properly and have good coverage with our bioexclude membrane, we want to get tension-free primary closure. We need to do a periosteal releasing incision to be able to get that passivation, particularly of the buccal flap. And I will use a bilayer suture technique where I'll alternate interrupted sutures with horizontal mattress sutures. And you can see that we've got some really nice closure here. And my suture of choice is typically a PTFE suture, although I have used monocryl from time to time as well. At the four week post-operative visit, we can see excellent healing. We can see that there's very little um, evidence of inflammation even. Uh, it looks like almost that nothing was done, but we can certainly see that there's been some good improvement in the alveolar ridge contour. And by three months, we can see further maturation uh, of these tissues. At six months, I call the patient back and we take a CBCT to see the amount of bone that we've regenerated. Now, truth be told, taking a CBCT, all it tells you is that there's bone material that's present. It doesn't really tell you what the nature of that graft is, right? So sometimes I've taken a CBCT, everything looks great. When I raise the flap, half the graft comes out with the flap. But nonetheless, it's nice to see that the material is still there. So we can see that at six months, we've been able to actually build up the ridge quite a bit, both in number eight and the number 10 sites, such that now if we were to place our implants, we'd have a good buckle shelf of bone surrounding both implants. And I'd be much more comfortable placing these implants into good healed uh, regenerated bone as well. Thanks to technology, we can do a lot of this planning now digitally. So at this point, I'll hand this over to the restoring dentist who will then take a, take a scan of, uh, of the patient's ridge and do a digital wax up and go over this with the patient and get the patient's approval. The restoring dentist and I can then 
plan the precise placement of these implants in such a manner that we can then get a CBCT uh, guide fabricated so that I can place the implants in a guided fashion precisely and that too in a way that can allow for a screw retained prosthesis. We all know the benefits of screw retained prostheses, uh, particularly uh, given the fact that cement being retained is a risk factor for peri-implantitis and screw retained prostheses have that element of retrievability in case there's an issue we can always just unscrew the prosthetic uh, take care of whatever we need to and then the prosthesis goes on without being sacrificed. So now it's time for us to do this surgery and so by the time I actually re-entered the site it had been about seven months following the GBR procedure and I already knew what to expect based on the CBCTs that I'd shown you previously but when I opened this up, I was very, very happy with what I saw. You can see this nice augmented ridge. Yes, the superficial layer, you can see still some particles, but this is not a deal breaker in any way. And when we compare the preoperative situation, we can see that we've done quite a bit of augmentation here and we'll not have a problem getting these implants in. As I mentioned earlier, we did the digital planning and fabricated a surgical guide with which I can now place the implants through in an exact location that the restoring dentist can use to make a screw retained prosthesis. Appreciate that these implants have at least a two to three millimeter shelf of buccal bone, which we know from the work of Grunder and colleagues is very, very important in preventing both hard tissue loss and recession, particularly in aesthetic sites. And here the implants are placed exactly uh, the way that we want in a nice parallel fashion, which is possible because we did a lot of this planning ahead of time. I, saw, I recently saw this patient for his one and a half year follow-up. I typically will see my patients every six months for the first couple of years after the prosthesis has gone in, the implants are being loaded, and then I'll see them annually after that point on. I'm very, very happy uh, with this result. I think the restoring dentist did a fantastic job uh, working with the lab um, to create great aesthetics. Uh, given the long-standing tooth loss and the extent of augmentation required, um, I'm not sure that we could have done any better in this case. Radiographically, certainly, the bone levels are stable and uh, very normal uh, for the first year and a half following loading. And finally, when we see the patient smile, uh, we can see how nice this aesthetic result is. The patient could not be any happier. He can smile again with confidence, eat again with confidence. Um, and overall, this case uh, was, it was so far and has been a huge success. I'm also very proud of this case because my uh, co colleague, Howie Tenenbaum, and myself, we wrote this case up uh, for publication, and it was accepted late last year by the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. So I'm hoping that it's in print sometime in the next six to nine months. Uh, this is the first case report of its kind, looking at using a bioexclude membrane exclusively as a sole barrier membrane for horizontal GBR. So stay tuned to, uh, to see this in print, hopefully sooner than later. My next case is also from the anterior maxilla, and this time it involves extractions with simultaneous horizontal GBR. So this gentleman was referred to me, uh, as you can see, it's quite obvious he has a failing bridge in the maxillary anterior where he's got some significant compromise of these abutment teeth. The gentleman's a healthy 77 year old fellow who is now looking for an implant uh, prosthetic solution. We can see from the radiographs how compromised these abutment teeth are. So there really isn't much choice here but to remove these teeth and to plan for implant therapy. So that's what we did. We extracted the teeth atraumatically, but when I was curetting around in the socket, now I didn't take a CBCT for this patient because he refused, but when I was curetting around in the socket, I noticed that uh, there was almost no facial bone for either of these uh, three sockets. And so we decided to, uh, to raise a flap and do a horizontal GBR procedure. And if we look at this ridge more carefully from the buckle view, we can see that there is a nice ridge deficiency where the upper right lateral incisor used to be. 
And as well, we can see that the buckle plate for the three extraction sockets is completely non-existent. So what do we do? First step I typically do is I'll, I'll decorticate uh, the site to try and get some undifferentiated cells from the, the marrow flowing into the area. And you can appreciate here, this gentleman's 77 years old, and I find that this is often the case with elderly patients, is that they don't bleed a whole lot. And uh, I feel that this could compromise the, the blood supply and the angiogenesis to the grafted area and compromise potentially uh, the bone healing. I then uh, will uh, take my autogenous scrapings uh, from the site and mix it in with my uh, xenograft, which is osteoconductive, and then graft the area. And you can see how much we've grafted, uh, both from the buccal view and the occlusal view. Once I'm happy that the graft is in place the way that I want, I will then take the bioexclude membrane and then drape it intimately over the site. Now, in this case, I think I probably used a couple of bioexclude membranes, but you can see how nicely it wraps, uh, it essentially adheres to the grafted area. It very much true to form with, uh, with the rice paper roll technique. But once again, you can see that there's no tacks or fixation sutures that are required. Sometimes you can barely see the membrane uh, when you put it on because it's such a thin radiolucent material. And of course, once again, we're going to get some tension-free primary closure by doing a periosteal release incision on the buckle. And in this case, I used 5-0 monocryl sutures, once again, using that bilayer technique. For this patient, I re-entered at about nine months after GBR. And overall, I was pretty happy with what I saw. We can see that we've got a nice ridge augmentation compared to before. Remember, we, were, we had a deficiency in the lateral site and then buccal plate blowouts in the other three sockets. So all things considered, I'm quite happy, uh, also considering the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of bleeding in the area, given the, the patient's age, the fact that I was able to get two implants in, in favorable locations, I was very happy with. I noticed with xenograft uh, ridges, that there's always this particulated appearance when I re-enter a lot of times. It doesn't really make a difference. Sometimes I will scrape off that superficial layer. Sometimes I'll leave it. Um, I don't have the same issue with allograft. I feel that the allograft seems to turn over more and look like real bone on re-entry. Nonetheless, I was able to get two implants in with excellent primary stability, which were then restored by the referring dentist about four months later. Now the implant on the upper right side uh, developed uh, an infection about a month and a half after placement, which we treated with some uh, very conservative debridement and antibiotics. And in the end, we were able to restore this with a four unit bridge, screw retained prosthesis, and radiographically, the bone levels look uh, pretty good for about, this is taken at six months uh, post loading. Again, the patient is very, very happy. Uh, that he finally has a good smile again, and more importantly, uh, the functionality of this bridge has been very good for the patient as well. Now here's a case where we extracted a hopeless tooth, let the area heal, and do some GBR after about eight weeks of healing. Um, I typically don't like to do bone grafting in areas where there's active infection or there's been an infection present for a long time. And this tooth was uh, diagnosed with a vertical root fracture and periapical infection. So we extracted, let the area heal. And about three months after extraction of this tooth, uh, we saw that the ridge had healed very, very nicely and we planned for a GBR procedure. So upon flap elevation, we can see that the area where the buccal plate is deficient obviously didn't heal up. But everywhere else is pretty good. It's a, it's a fairly well-contained defect, much to my uh, surprise. So we have the task now of, of getting this bone back. It's almost like a, a socket preservation in a way with a lost buckle plate. Nonetheless, we graft, in this case, I used a mineralized cortical cancellous allograft or FDBA. And here you can see how we've grafted uh, on the buckle and you can see an occlusal view as well. We then take our bioexclude membrane and layer it over the graft. And we can see that it's almost, it's very hard to see 
Uh, but again, it adapts very, very intimately to the area that's crafted. Again, we have tension-free primary closure with 4.0 PTFE sutures. And with the mandible, we're worried about a muscle pull that we're not as worried about in the maxilla. And so I tend to try and release the buccal flap a little bit more, trying to anticipate that muscle pull leading to retraction. And so this leads me to talk about the healing of this particular case. Just out of curiosity, I called the patient back at three days to get an idea of how it looked like with healing. And to my surprise, I thought the healing looked pretty good. There was actually uh, less of an inflammatory response than I've seen with more conventional membranes. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that this membrane uh, is essentially made of immunoprivileged material. It doesn't really incite a huge inflammatory response. But you can see both from the buccal and occlusal views that there's been some slight exposure of the membrane. And one of the advantages of this particular membrane is that if it becomes exposed, it's actually no big deal because cells can actually migrate across this membrane uh, without much problem. And the best way to demonstrate that is by showing you a case that I did where I used the bioexclude membrane for socket preservation. So in this case, I extracted a hopeless lower left first molar and grafted the socket with xenograft bovine bone, and then we covered this bone with bioexclude membrane. We then used a reverse figure eight suturing technique just to help hold the edges of, of the, the buccal and lingual aspects of the socket together, but you can see how much of that membrane was left exposed. And if you look at the 10-day post-op, you can see how nice that healing is after that membrane has been left exposed. This is certainly not something you see with a conventional membrane uh, that's been exposed to the oral cavity or even in a non-grafted socket. So the fact that maybe a tiny amount of my membrane was exposed in the case that I was showing you uh, doesn't worry me in the least because I know that over time it will heal over and keratinize. I called the patient back at one week and we can see that there's been perhaps a little bit more exposure of that membrane and a little bit more retraction of that buccal flap. But again, I'm not concerned about it because there's not a whole lot of inflammation. There's certainly no signs of infection. And I'm confident that over time, that area will uh, keratinize over. At two weeks, we can see that uh, the healing is pretty stable and steady. And by three months, we can see that that wound has completely closed over. If you look carefully, there is some inflammation on the mesial aspect of uh, the lower incisor. Um, and I found out later from the patient that she had irritated that while eating some popcorn. So now we're ready to re-enter the site at seven months. And we can see that the soft tissue at least has healed very, very nicely. We've got some decent contour on the buccal aspect as well. And when we raise our flap, we can see that we have nice width of regenerated ridge that looks very nice. And as I mentioned, this was done with allograft, which typically tends to have a much better appearance than xenograft upon re-entry. I was able to place an implant in a prosthetically favorable location. Uh, and you can see that there's been at least a couple of millimeters of buccal shelf uh, around this implant. And because of the primary stability being so good, we placed a healing abutment and uh, closed up, but not before we did a small connective tissue graft just to try and uh, augment the tissue on that lower left incisor. And this is what the patient looks like at one year. Um, you can see that the crown looks very nice, very aesthetic, excellent lab work. Uh, we have a screw retained prosthesis as you can appreciate um, from the, the occlusal view and an excellent soft tissue profile on the buccal and lingual aspects of this implant. Radiographically, we can see stable bone levels at one year, and the patient has had no problems with function, um, and aesthetically, there's no concerns because nobody really sees that tooth anyway. But the patient is very happy, and I'm very happy uh, for uh, being able to do what we were able to do. Now, the last case I'm gonna share with you is implant placement with simultaneous GBR in the anterior mandible. So this is very similar to the case I just showed you. Uh, the first case, I was a bit more conservative. I extracted the tooth and let the area heal for three months. Uh, in this particular case, 
um, we, we took the tooth out and let the area heal for three months. And it's healed up very, very nicely. And then we went back in and decided to place an implant. Now we can see here from these two pictures on the left-hand side that there's a, a bony fenestration. And there's also a, a bit of a ridge deficiency as well. But we've got excellent bone on the proximal aspects. So as I was preparing this site for implant placement, um, as expected, there was a bit of a blowout of the buccal plate. But the implant is still within the envelope of bone. And we just have to graft that buccal aspect of the implant. Implant was placed with really good primary stability. And radiographically, we can see good placement as well. I then used allograft to, to graft over that buccal dehiscence of bone, took the bioexclude membrane, and placed it over the bone graft, where it's almost, again, it's almost hard to see. It's not like a conventional membrane in that sense. It's very thin, it's very radiolucent, but I don't need to use any sutures. I don't, don't need to use any tacks. It just stays where I want it to stay perfectly. I let the area heal submerge for a few months before doing an uncovery surgery for the patient where we can see stable bone levels. A healing abutment was placed. A few weeks later, the patient was seen by his general dentist to have the implant restored. And the picture you're seeing here is, I believe, nine months following implant restoration. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the way that everything looks. The only thing I'm not too happy with is the patient's uh, oral hygiene. Um, having said that, the crowns that he has on either side of the implant crown are in need of repair anyway. They're, they're plaque retentive. And I, I feel that once he gets new crowns, which is uh, in his treatment plan uh, for these adjacent teeth, that he'll be able to practice uh, good oral hygiene around these areas as well. It doesn't seem to be a problem in other areas of his mouth. Radiographically, bone levels are stable as well. In conclusion, I hope that I've been able to impress upon you that BioExclude can be used as the sole barrier membrane for most horizontal GBR procedures in the maxilla and mandible. Don't be fooled by its thin, flimsy, delicate appearance. It is resilient material. And that's not surprising given that it is derived from placental tissue, which is inherently designed to be one of the most resilient tissues in the human body when you think about what it's supposed to do. BioExclude is different compared to conventional barrier membranes in that it is bioactive, contains a wide array of various molecules from extracellular matrix proteins to interleukins to cytokines and other things that confer favorable healing properties and also anti-inflammatory properties. And the membrane has also been shown to have antimicrobial properties. So in addition to a barrier, it is also a carrier. Once you get past the learning curve, you'll really come to appreciate the favorable handling and physical properties of this membrane, especially when you don't have to use any tacks or fixation sutures, thereby decreasing the total time needed for treatment, any frustrations and headaches that come with trying to do some fancy sutures just to hold the membrane in place. We know that this membrane can be left exposed and handles the harshness of the oral environment very well. If it can be left exposed in a molar socket preservation site, then a tiny exposure during GBR healing is not going to spell catastrophe for the healing bone. And last but not least, <clears throat> it is quite cost effective. If all you're using is this one membrane, then you save the cost that you would normally have if you were to open up a couple of membranes and now tacks and sutures. So this membrane has been a real game changer for me in my private practice over the last two and a half to three years. And I'm really happy with the types of results I've seen with these various cases across all indications, not just in plantology, but in periodontal plastic surgery, periimplantitis, and GTR around natural teeth. So I highly encourage that you give this a try. I think you'll be very pleased with the results that you get. And just like that, our time has come to an end. I want to thank you sincerely for taking time out of your busy schedule to hear me lecture. I hope you found what I had to say and show interesting and informative and that you'd perhaps even consider implementing some of these things in your private practice. 
I'm quite active on social media. You can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Pide Perio or email me at vinay.pide at utoronto.ca. Enjoy the rest of this virtual annual meeting. I look forward to the day when we can meet again in person. And now I look forward to the live Q&A. Thanks again, everyone.